Hi everyone, so time for another video. Uh, I just wanted to cover a few things. So firstly, thank you for the amazing support. Um, we are over 500 subscribers now on the channel and the channel is growing uh, quite quickly, which I'm super pleased with. Hopefully you're noticing a huge improvement to the audio quality. I've taken your feedback on board and I've purchased a decent microphone. So please let me know in the comments if the audio quality is better in this video compared to some of the other videos. But you might be asking what this particular video is going to be about. So we're continuing on with the 40 gate series, showing users how to get the best out of some of the next generation firewall features. So we've already covered web filtering and application control in two of our previous videos. Uh, and in this video, we're going to do IPS. So you might ask yourselves, what is IPS? So it's actually an improvement on IDS. So the difference between IPS and IDS is that IPS has the ability to monitor and act. It's known as virtual patching whereas IDS has the ability to monitor and flag potential threats, but it does not have the ability to respond. So what I'm going to show in this video is how to configure IPS effectively. It's very mem memory intensive. So if you do not tweak IPS filters by doing things like selecting its uh, client or server-based signatures, or potentially the customer only has a Windows environment or a Mac environment, using those filters to mean that you're filtering down the amount of signatures that the, the, the gate has to path through, then you're not going to run into some memory issues. If you just simply log on to a 40 gate appliance, you've got the light, uh, license in, well, then you just simply uh, configure IPF to monitor every single signature uh, that's been created. There's uh, 10,600 at the time of creating this video. That's the extended database. Um, then it's likely that if you're using some of the more entry-level models um, and you've got lots of data going through your environment, then you expect your memory to go through the roof. So what I've done here is I've uh, created a little bit of a, a diagram just to show the different ways that you can use IPS. There's actually three uh, ways. So the first um, way is protecting um, an internal resource from the outside internet. So let's say I'm uh, out on the internet, I've got a virtual IP configured on this 40 gate, um, and I have a web server, WordPress web server running. Um, so the packet comes in from the internet, it hits the 40 gate, appliance, and then it uses a virtual IP to go to the WordPress web server or Apache, whatever, whatever you, you, you want to, you want to call it. Um, so there's lots of vulnerabilities and things associated with WordPress. So what you can do is when the packet comes in, you can apply an IPS filter um, against the firewall policy that matches the virtual IP for this particular web server. Um, and you can have the gate at some of the known threats against WordPress or Apache, for example. The second flow is the exact opposite. Now, this is definitely misunderstood, but you can definitely, definitely use IPS for traffic that is leaving your network. Now, you might want to, you might think about that and go, well, hold on a minute, hang on. Why would I care about scrubbing and protecting traffic that's leaving my environment? So things like command and control servers could exist on the internet. Fortinet has a known database against associated fully qualified domain names, IP addresses that you know are known to be command and control servers. It can simply block the communication outbound. So again, just an example, I've got a Windows 11 machine here that suddenly start trying to communicate with a known command and control server. Um, and the FortiGate appliance has the ability to block that communication. Last example is you, there might not be a, a way to actually 
packed for these systems. So it's it's known as virtual packing. Um, you might have a Windows 11 host that sits, you know, in a segmented network or it, it, even inside the same network if you're doing inter VLAN blocking, um, and that has the ability to communicate with programmable logic controllers. So what you want to do is you might want to apply some IPF signatures to protect against the known exploits that have been found on the programmable logic controller. So just to be clear, the packet leaves the Windows 11 host. You've configured it in a way that it, it needs to go via the FortiGate firewall uh, and then towards the programmable logic controller. You can apply an IPF filter to essentially pack um, the known threats um, at the packet level as it's um, transversing across the 40 gate firewall. Okay, so the next phase of the video is to actually configure um, intrusion prevention um, and apply it to our security policy. So um, the, the first example that we're going to do is we're going to look at traffic that's um, on my internal network already and is leaving to an external source. So I've got a packet um, that's originating from uh, my PC here um, and it's it's leaving to an external source. So I've configured uh, just the name here, um, Windows and Mac only. So this is um, definitely best practice. Um, I'm using the extended database and I've only got an ATF, so it does take a second to load. So this is very much best practice. So instead of going um, into the IPS sensor and just simply saying match uh, all 10,600 signatures and apply it, which would generally send you CPU and memory through the roof, I've actually got a little bit more granular with my configuration. So names, Windows and Mac only. Um, I want to block malicious URLs. Uh, that, that's taken via the 40 guard recommendations and database. But I've actually said only match based on these signatures. So it's a client and the operating system has to be Windows or Mac. And uh, for the purposes of this video, I only I just want to do monitor mode only. Um, I've also said that for botnet and command and control servers, I want to scan outgoing connections and I want to monitor that activity. Uh, and there's 3,128 IP addresses in that are known to be associated with command and control servers. If you look here, here's the list of them at the moment. So to actually configure the firewall policy, it's the same as um, applying uh other security policies like application control, et cetera, it's all done at the firewall policy level. So you go to firewall policy. We're going to edit this disabled rule here that just matches the MAC address for some of the um, some of my, my uh, internal clients. Click into that. Um, and you will see that um, IPS is not currently enabled. So enable. And we want to select the Windows and Mac only um, we do i do recommend doing deep packet inspection um, simply because everything is using ssl tls these days 90 percent of traffic so it's likely that um, once the initial exchange takes place which is a couple of packets um, if you're not doing this then you're not going to be able to see into the traffic uh, therefore it's not going to be able to defend against it um, simply would click ok and that would be uh, how to enable the IPS sensor for Windows and Mac clients only. These machines are only Windows or Mac. Um, and yeah, that's how it's done. Okay, so what I've done now is um, I've gone back into the security policy, so the, the Windows and Mac configuration. I've changed the, it from uh, monitor to blocking. Um, found one of the IP addresses that uh, is a known command and control uh, server that's associated with uh, bits, rats. Um, I've got the IP address and um, I've simply tried to browse to it on the, the known exploited port. Um, and as you can see in login reports, security events, 
I'm taking this from memory at the minute because I've only just done it. Uh, I'm matched against intrusion prevention. You can see that the initial first three packets were detected, but were not um, blocked. That's because I left it in uh, monitoring mode. Then once I change the configuration to block in, you can see that these three packets here were dropped via the IPS engine. So the next uh, example that I'll use is using IPS sensors to, to protect uh, against lateral movement. Um, so uh, you must have intra VLAN blocking um, to be able to do this, um, or you might you need to have two different um, policies defined from, from a segment, a way, a way of free segmentation perspective. So you would create firewall rules between them. But uh, I'm going to do one around Omron PLC. So I'm creating a new intrusion prevention uh, sensor. I've named it Omron PLC IPS. Uh, I'm going to create new. I've filtered via the name Omron. And I'm going to apply all these signatures here to my policy. I'm going to click OK on that. Going to go to firewall policy. You'll see that I have created um, a new firewall policy here. Um, again, interview on blocking would need to be enabled for this to be a, a correct configuration. Um, I've got PLC um, that's on 192.168.100.1 and a PLC that's on 192.168.100.2. Um, you might want to apply an IPF sensor to defend. Um, the communication of actually, I think probably a better example would be if a Windows machine was trying to communicate with the second PLC. So let's do that actually. Um, so this Windows PC is trying to communicate with this PLC here. Perhaps potentially this Windows PC has been um, compromised. Uh, it's trying to uh, recon and probe the PLC. Um, so we would stop that with an IPS sensor, would use the the one that's got the Omron PLC signatures matched. Again, deep packet inspection is, is recommended because once you get beyond the first few packets, if the packets are, let's say, wrapped around with TLS, um, SSL, then good luck because it's encrypted. It won't be able to see into it. Um, and that's what the firewall policy would look like. And you enable it. And um, there we go. You see from Chris's, my, my sim racing PC to this PLC, um, make sure that you are applying virtual patching, let's say, to the signatures that are, uh, we configured uh, to try and defend this programmable logic controllers. So that brings the IPS video uh, to a close. Just to be clear, this is only an entry level uh, exploration. The video is 12 minutes long already. Uh, and so I don't want to go super detailed with, with this particular series. But to clarify, IPF can be used to protect packets that are originating from an, your internal network to an external network. Maybe it will try and uh, it's, uh, that, that packet flow is um, the detonation is a known command and control server. Uh, IPS will block that communication. It can be used to block internal to internal communication and defend against lateral movement. Um, and it can also be used to defend um, in external to internal um, communication. So if I've got a PC on the public internet and I've got a mail server um, that lives inside my network um, and that mail server has a bunch of uh, vulnerabilities associated with it, um, you could use IPS to defend against that. Um, that brings the video to a close. As always, thanks so much um, to you. If you've got to the end of this video, um, please give me some comments and feedback in the description below, and we'll see you in the next video in this series.